Mother's Day at Hardy Hall Dining Room. I'm not entirely sure why I hated Mother's Day. I shouldn't have. It was the biggest day of the year for Hardy Hall. A successful Mother's Day would ensure our livelihood until the next holiday season. It was just that it was so difficult. The challenge of that day always meant that we had to be ready. Being ready, though, was not enough. The most nerve-wracking was having to depend on all those things we couldn't control. Would all the help show up? The high school prom was always on that weekend. All our waitresses were certain to be invited to the after-prom celebration that Sunday traditionally held at Turkey Run State Park. The fear was always, what if they never showed up? What would we do to be able to handle those hordes of people that were sure to come? Then there was the weather. If it had been unseasonably hot, that meant two things. Sweltering temperatures inside the restaurant and running out of drinking water. If all the wells ran dry, we would lose Dan from his dishwashing post. With the relish of an escaped convict, he would escape to the basement and assume his pump jockeying position and commence priming and coaxing the pumps. If there was any water out there, to be found in those five wells, he would do it. There he'd be, down in the depths of the cool, quiet basement, carefully ministering to his water pumps, priming them, cursing them, and sometimes even striking them in frustration. Valiantly, he would sit in his chair, surrounded by a half circle of pipes connecting pumps, pressure tanks, and valves, thumping, checking, adjusting, all of the ritualistic things necessary to find the water needed to finish out the day. Meanwhile, the constant flood of dirty dishes would begin to stack up because Dan wasn't there to pounce on them. Hardy Hall was an old, elegant farm home built in 1908. A brick construction and high ceilings, it remained cool and livable most of the year. When over a hundred people converged on it at once to eat their noon meal dressed in their Sunday finery, temperatures and tempers quickly left the zone of comfort. Families would line up inside the foyer. The living room was filled with tables. Tables were placed at almost every corner of the first floor. The restaurant was a sea of people, standing, sitting, and milling about. There were the prudent customers, the ones who made the early reservations, arrived, ate, and departed just as the rush would begin and the heat would rise. As the day would progress, we would fall still farther behind. People expected to be seated at their reserved time would be delayed. Larger groups would always take longer than expected. We would then begin to get creative and start seating the larger odd number family at a table meant to handle smaller parties. This condensing of people and furniture would make things appear even more crowded. The kitchen was a madhouse. Plates were rattling, glasses clinking, silverware crashing, and the kitchen help barking orders, pleas, and commands resulting in an orchestral cacophony that played out every year. It reminded one of a mad opera. The contrast between the noise of the steaming kitchen and the chattering voices of the dining room patrons was made clear each time we crashed through the swinging dining room door. This was the door between two worlds. In the dining room, our job was to, in Mother's words, create a memorable dining experience. That meant doing whatever we could to give the customers more than just a meal. Back in the bowels of the kitchen scullery, the mayhem continued. Out of sight of the customer's gaze, the kitchen brigade found it difficult sometimes to keep with the spirit of creating a memorable dining experience. The food orders would be laid out on the log serving table and filled in a first-come, first-serve order. Then there would be the special circumstances orders. The ones who appeared to be good tippers would be would need special preference and move ahead of the line. Too much of this would inevitably infuriate Sally, the cook. Sally typically was very easy to get along with until she felt she was being pushed just a little too far. Then in the midst of all the chaos, Sally would go on strike vowing to never fill another order. Usually it was Karen who would push her over the edge. Then everyone would gather around the troubled Sally and begin soothing her. Finally, after what seemed an eternity, Sally would feel that her point was taken seriously, 
Promises were made from the waitstaff that they would do a better job of sticking to the order of things. Soon the sharp comments of the waitstaff about getting all the tips would be forgotten and things would begin anew. Mother would be out front during all this commanding like a general. She believed that each dining customer must have more than a full stomach when they left Hardy Hall Dining Room. She always believed that her restaurant was different than any other in the area. If you wanted to only get stuffed, there were many other places to go. It was her mission and goal in life to illuminate her customers on the joy of dining versus feeding. And there was a difference. That difference was inculcated into each of her dining room army and rear kitchen echelons she commanded. It started with making sure that each and every customer was greeted when they were arrived. An exchange of pleasantries while they were being seated was part of making them feel at home. They would be seated at a table that would be set perfectly in a dining room of tables that were each set perfectly. Each napkin had a backward L design. The backward L always meant to face away from the fork under which it was placed. The water glasses must be less than an inch from the knife. The cup and saucer must be an inch to the right of each spoon. Each cup must be pointed at a 90 degree angle away from the spoon. No exceptions. Butter pats that required being speared by a fork in order to be served was performed to be more prevalent because paper encased butter pats at the other local restaurants and cafes just wouldn't do. Rarely except for finer restaurants was the small but elegant touch ever replicated. For the salads, the tomatoes must be peeled before slicing. The jello must be placed on decorated piece of lettuce before serving. The serving of jello salad was never so elegant. Salads were not enough for Hardy Hall's patrons. A relish tray loaded with fresh crunched carrots, bite-sized celery, pickles, and fresh radishes went with every order. The radishes were never placed on the relish tray without first being decoratively carved first. Their looking like an ordinary red radish would not do. The publicity, or the possibility, of an uncarved ordinary radish infiltrating a relish tray would certainly diminish this dining experience. Each dinner plate should appear as a work of art. No gravy, chop, potato, or vegetable should ever be out of place. Each place must be wiped clean of any excess before it left the kitchen. Most of all, no plate must ever leave the kitchen without its garnish, parsley. Most people visiting Hardy Hall Dining Room had never heard of a garnish, and most thought that the parsley was something grown in a garden. The patrons' comments and questions would range from, What is this? to, Are we supposed to eat this? Mother would never tire of gleefully telling her legions of customers about why parsley was always on the plate she served to be her own views of what dining experience should be. It was her hope that if she could educate her customers, they would be more appreciative of what she was trying to provide them. In turn, by knowing what they should experience, Mother had hoped that her customers would feel more special at her restaurant than elsewhere. It must have worked. Most of the regular customers who knew and desired what a quality dining experience was dined regularly there, often driving 60 miles for that experience. They would tell their friends and bring their families. They would become an extension of the Crispin family. Hardy Hall's help consisted of us five children. We all believed in creating the dining experience. For us, it was simple to give customers the best dining experience possible or they would not come back. They always would they would not tell their friends since we had no marketing and advertising budget word of mouth advertising and repeat customers meant everything to our restaurant we all knew without saying it that without a steady stream of customers we would not survive that was one of the reasons the mental preparation for mother's day was so important and so tiring each mother's day it was as if we were challenged to see if we were still worthy to compete in the business arena this was our test to see if we were professional or amateur food service providers. Each year for 10 years, Mother and her army of dining room and kitchen staff would ready itself for battle on this proving ground of contest and competition and strike out to show itself worthy of being included in the ranks of the professional. This was not a mom and pop outfit. This was mom's professional food service outfit. We were there to compete that day and every day on the battlefield of business to unashamedly show the world that we were there and for them to consider 
and be served, to fail, to not show up, to give up in to the terrors of failing to meet the standard were always there in front of us. It would begin in the Sunday, in the morning on Sunday. Mother would never go to church, but she wanted each of us to go. That cut two hours into our early morning schedule, which had to be made up by getting up a little earlier and making the necessary preparations so that we could go to church. Each of us practically walked through our Sunday school morning chores like zombies. We knew exactly what needed to be done. Being carefully awake was optional. I took an inventory of the things needed from the storeroom in the basement. I brought them up and opened each can. They were very large cans. I also stocked the cold room with ju cases of juice and boxes of condiments. Dan would have cut up all the chickens, up to 40 or more. Sally would be cooking the gravy, frying the Swiss steak, cooking the ham and roast beef. The ajus had to be just right. Karen made sure the dining room and reservations were in order. Little Billy helped wherever he could, eventually taking over all the duties as we left, one, left for college. Like a well-oiled machine, the Crispin family moved quietly but deliberately about their duties each Sunday morning. Sometimes the mother would feel the pressure of the upcoming day and begin barking orders at us. But we knew our jobs and tried not to let her get too much in the way. It never failed to work out. After that, going to church seemed like an escape. Once returned from church, each of us would suit up in our uniforms and jump back into the fray. By then, the rest of the help was already there. If any of the newer or younger girls or ladies were not getting it, Mother would take this early pre-opening time to go over what it meant to be delivering a dining experience one more time. Many of the times meant teaching them to wash their hands every time after going to the bathroom. Much has happened to all of us since those days. Whatever our memories are, we are all profoundly affected as we, affect, as we affected others who were drawn to that place in the country and in time, the place called Hardy Hall. <laughs>